Number 9. This is probably karma from always saying that my town is boring and needs more excitement. Well, I take it back. This is when I used to stay up all night and sleep through the day, as most unemployed teenagers will probably do. We just recently moved into a new house, probably around six months or so ago, and our new kitchen is a lot smaller than our old one. So we had to ditch our big freezer and only keep a small fridge in our kitchen. We got a new freezer and stuck the old one in our garage, which was at the end of our back garden. Anyway, I'd usually end up having to venture outside at stupid o'clock in the morning for some food, and I remember one night in particular. My memory is pretty shit when it comes to things like this, but this, for some reason, just stuck in my head. I'd gone outside with my usual knife. I'm a paranoid wimp, don't judge and gone into the garage to look for some food. Now, the garage door doesn't have a handle, just a lock. You unlock it and the door just swings open, which kind of creeps me out, especially as the freezer is a few feet away from the door, so you'd be standing with your back to the door. Before I could even pull up the freezer door, it's one of those ones with like a lid, you pull it up. I noticed that there was an ID card, or something like that, just sitting there on the freezer. Weird. It wasn't one of my family's, just some average looking guy, lots of stubble, white, and probably about mid-thirties. I can't remember the name. I think it was something like Colin or Graham, something like that. In hindsight, I probably should have taken a picture of it. I started to get really creeped out at that point. I didn't recognize him. I'd never seen him before. After looking around our garage, I also found one of those bright yellow work coats with the silver stripes. Again, it doesn't belong to anyone in the house. It's just my mum, two younger kids and I, so it wasn't any of ours. I was past the point of freaked out until I realised that it was probably just one of my mum's boyfriend's stuff. She got back into the dating scene recently, so it's just probably one of theirs. I waited until morning to ask her about it, to be sure. What ID? Okay, now I was freaking the fuck out. I took her into the garage to show her, and this is the part that really makes my blood run cold. They weren't there. Gone. Hasta la vista. Disappeared. I think I may have wet my pants a little, being honest. It wasn't my mum. I'd gone to see her as soon as she'd woken up. ID cards don't just grow legs and walk away. So either I was losing my mind or someone had been here to collect their stuff in the middle of the night. She just thinks I'm joking with her or making it up. I was prepared to let it go, to just ignore it and pretend like it never happened. But a few days after it happened, I was walking into the shop down the road for tea when someone called my name. I turned around expecting to see one of my friends or something, but this middle-aged man just approached me, pressed a wrapper into my hand, grinned at me, and left. I was just confused for a while, until I realized that it was the fucking guy. That face from the ID card, fucking Colin or Graham or whatever the bastard's name was. I didn't know his name, but he certainly knew mine. I didn't really know what to do, to be quite honest. I was near tears and I just ran home without getting anything. I told my mum about it, but surprise, surprise, she never believed me. I didn't know what to do or how to feel about any of it, but I never told anyone else. It's been a few months and I've moved in with my sister. I haven't seen him since and I've been back a few times. Looking back... It could have been just one of my mum's friends who knows me, or maybe it's not. Number 8 Let me begin by telling you that this story is 100% accurate, and I'm sure you would have no trouble finding it online. I live in Oklahoma, but I'm not willing to release the name of the area to which these events happened. I started as a 911 operator dispatcher during my senior year of college. 
After my training, which took three months, I was placed on the night shift. As a dispatcher for a relatively small county, this shift would get extremely slow and mostly consist of medical and suspicious activity calls. Usually nothing too crazy, and besides, I was a rather thick-skinned individual, so when something did go wrong, I would brush it off of my shoulder and remain professional. However, about eight months into the job, that all changed. Everything changed. Beginning one Friday night, around 2am, I received a 911 hang-up call. Of course, when this happens, operators are required to immediately call back. If the recipient fails to answer and the number was from a landline attached to a home address, then we would dispatch a unit for a 1090 or a welfare check. This would happen often, usually a few times a week and almost always turned out to be an accidental dial. This particular time, after I requested the 1090, I got a call from the responding officer's personal phone. He was at the address I gave him, but informed me that the house was abandoned and boarded up. I double-checked the address and, yes, it was the same location. Figuring there was a screw-up on the computer map's end, we left it alone and didn't give it any other thought. The very next night, around the same time, another call came from the same number. I recall remembering the number because the last four digits were 4400, a pretty recognizable number. And again, it was a hang-up. After trying back several times, I had no choice but to dispatch another officer. It was policy and something I didn't want to risk my job for. After calling it in, the responding officer said that he would get to it, which he never did. He called me on the cruiser a few hours later and said that it wasn't worth the time and that it was probably an error on the phone lines. We agreed and went on with our duties but something felt ominous about the situation. Maybe it was the way the silences sounded when I answered both of the calls. Like the type of silence where you hear nothing, but sense that someone is there. It bothered me the rest of the shift and even weighed on my mind at home. The worst of it came on the third night, my final night before a much needed vacation. It was again around the same time when the phone rang and the 4400 number displayed on the screen. I was nervous for some reason, even though I knew it was nothing. 911, what is your emergency? Again, silence. But this time, there was no immediate hang up. Hello, this is 911. Do you have an emergency? There was another few seconds of silence when a weak voice on the other end responded. It was the voice of what sounded to be a little boy. Okay, what is your address? I asked. We are required to ask this even if we have the address on hand. Besides, the address that was displayed was obviously incorrect. You know what the address is. There was a policeman here the other night. Please, send another. My heart dropped when he said this. Okay, what is your name? I responded clearly disturbed but trying to remain calm. Daniel, I just want to go home. Okay, Daniel, we're going to get you home. Tell me exactly what's going on. Silence took over again, and then a dial tone. I immediately called back while my co-workers were already dispatching units. There was no answer on the first call back, but on the second call, an ugly, foul, graveled voice answered in a livid tone. It's too late. Don't bother calling back. They hung up immediately after and I was in near shock. I called back several times but received no answer. I dispatched information that there was a child possibly in danger and an adult man occupying the home. I sat not knowing anything for about 40 minutes. By far the longest period of time I've ever experienced. The anxiety only doubled when... I received information that the house was completely empty and no one was found. After several officers broke through the home boards and locks, their only findings were a fresh pack of gum and an old telephone. I found out exactly what happened on the news a few weeks later. The boy, a 10-year-old who had been kidnapped by a known child predator, was held prisoner in that abandoned house for several weeks. He somehow got an old phone line to work and when the predator fell asleep, he would quietly call 911 with the little opportunity he had. 
It kills me to say. But the boy was found dead, and the monster who murdered him was never captured. This was the darkest experience of my life, and I highly doubt it will ever be topped, nor will I ever get over it. The sound of the boy's voice is still clear as day, and often fuels my nightmares, even after four years. Needless to say, I ended up my time as a dispatcher, 911 operator, shortly after. The experience is therapeutic to share, and I just pray to God that one day, justice is served. Number 7 So, I have never really told this, because of the fact that it's close to a lot of fictional stories that exist. Maybe the concept is creepy. Maybe this event was the basis for these stories. I don't really know. I just know that it was completely true. I was shown the newspaper clippings from the event when I was a kid. It was the late 60s when this took place, so it was quite some time ago. It happened to my father when he was a boy. They had a swing set in their backyard. He would often wake up earlier than everyone else and go outside and play in the morning. So there was nothing too strange that morning when they heard him getting up and going outside to play or the creak of the swing set. This morning though, my father opened the back door and ran outside into the foggy mist. He stopped in his tracks though as he noticed a hunched over figure gently swaying on one of the swings. It was a little old lady. In his Polish household, they called her a babushka. This was because of the babushka, the old ladies tied around their heads. She was clutching a little brown paper bag in her arms. They were out there for some time, when finally my grandpa woke up and went to get a glass of water. As he sat there at the sink, he looked out the window over the kitchen sink and saw them in the backyard. The woman was clearly talking to my father. She whispered something in his ear and he got up to go to the door. The woman got up behind him and proceeded to follow him. My grandfather went to the door and opened it and stood there, letting his son pass him as he stared at the woman. As I'm told, she stopped in her tracks and turned around and sat back on the swing, then smiled at him and went back to swinging. He shut the door, locked it and told my father to go to his room and called the police. She sat there and waited the whole time. She never left. She just kept swinging as the police showed up and talked to her. Now as you all know, because like I said, this is extremely similar to the creepypasta. When the cops looked into the bag, it was just literally knives and rope. That was all. As I am told, it was a silly amount of knives too. Like specialty knives. Knives for boning, carving, butchering. My father wasn't around much when I was a kid. I was told this story by my grandfather when I was little, and I instantly told him that I didn't believe him. Even as a young child, I didn't believe it. So he went out and fetched a yellow newspaper clipping, an excerpt from the newspaper. It mentioned the lady, the knives, the rope, the swing set, everything. I have always thought it was weird later on in life when I read similar stories. It seemed like a popular concept, but I knew that it happened in real life. My father really never told anyone exactly everything they talked about. He did admit that what she had whispered to him as he got up was something to the extent of going inside so that they could play with the whole family. He said nothing about anything else about what they said, but they were out there for a while. My father died when I was 15. He was never in my life anyways, so I never really got any more details from him, but my aunt and grandfather had told me the story many times. My grandfather always seemed the most nervous about it. He didn't like the way she looked or the fact that she just waited for the police. He said my grandmother had called her Baba Jaga, which was like this old country demon lady who ate children which weirdly enough is where the word babushka comes from, according to some. They took down the swing set and everything after that, and my father wasn't allowed to go play alone in the morning anymore. It was probably one of the creepiest things I've ever heard in my life, and it's been a story that stuck with me since I was a young child. 
One of those memories that, no matter how old you get, it stays with you, vividly. Early fogs in the morning have creeped me out every time. I am always waiting to see her. Number 6 This happened just under a year ago. I had just broken up with my boyfriend and he had moved out of our house and my mum was staying with me temporarily for emotional support. We were sitting in my small living room at about 11pm one night when there were a succession of panicked, loud knocks at my front door downstairs. My mum and I both jumped and she gave me a weird look but went downstairs to answer it anyway. She ventured down the stairs trying to catch a glimpse of whoever was knocking through the window beside my front door. When she was closer, she saw a man about 6'2", wearing a tight white t-shirt. He was muscled and well shaven and seemed to be grinning at the closed door. She opened it gingerly and we got a better look at him. He was sweating bullets despite the fact that it was a cool November night and his eyes were open unnaturally wide and he was still grinning. He spoke immediately. Hi, um, I'm sure you don't know me but um, I'm, I'm actually in a bit of a pickle here. I'm really hoping you can help me. It was at that moment that I had come up behind my mum and his eyes alighted upon me while his grin stretched wider. Hey, I know her. I was nonplussed and more than a little unsettled. I had never seen this man in my life. His reaching out to shake my hand right afterwards, despite knowing me, didn't help. He kept talking, faster now. Uh, I'm Brian, Brian from next door. My key snapped off in the lock and I can't get into my place and I just really need some help here and... My mum cut in here. Do you need me to call someone for you? He shook his head immediately. No, no. I just really need some help, you know? My mum was done at this point and said in a level voice that she was just going to go upstairs for a moment and then quickly closed and locked the door. We went straight upstairs and looked out the window that overlooked the street my house was on. He must have stood at my doorstep for a good five minutes before booking it down the street. He never went next door. Number 5 This frightening situation happened during Thanksgiving break. My friend Angela and I were high school acquaintances but got really close during college. Naturally, we carpooled to and from our university to our hometown, which is around five hours away by car. At the end of Thanksgiving break, we leave around 11pm and start our trip back. Around three hours in on the road trip, Angela, the driver, tells me that she's starting to feel a bit sleepy. So rather than stop in the middle of nowhere and change seats, I decided to talk to her and keep her busy. We get into a really deep conversation and for fun, we decide to Snapchat a little of the road trip with the flashlight on. I know, stupid. After laughing and Snapchatting, we see police sirens go on right behind us. Great. It's 2am and the cops pull us over. They stayed in their car for a few minutes, which seemed odd, but oh well we thought. As I see two of them walking towards us, they whispered something to each other, but I didn't think anything of it then. One of them goes to Angela's window and the other to mine. Hey there, ladies. The one by Angela's window says. How are you all doing tonight? With this creepy-ass smile. Non-suspecting Angela responds good. She then asks what the reason for pulling us over was. Going over the speed limit, he says. Mind you... We were snapchatting right before he pulled us over, and Angela was purposely going a little under the speed limit so as not to crash and just to be safe while we were on snapchat. Confused, she just says okay, and asks if he needs any documentation, to which he responds no. While all of this is going on, the second cop by my window signals me to lower the window, and I oblige. He then starts making insinuating comments and gestures towards me. For example, he starts pointing his flashlight towards my crotch while smiling, telling me how long my legs were, asking, 
Oh, so it's just you two. I see. And what were we doing at this time, in the middle of nowhere? Amongst other things that, honestly, were not related at all to pulling us over, and out of line for police officers to be asking. Then the first cop asks if we're going to college, to which we respond yes. Actually, we're heading to the university. I knew we fucked up there because they now know that we weren't heading anywhere close. He then proceeds to say, College girls, huh? to the other cop again with that eerie smile. By this time, we were beyond creeped out and wanted to get out of this situation ASAP, but these creeps wouldn't let us go. They kept trying to make conversation while implying really weird sexual stuff like, Y'all know where we're at? There's a prison nearby here, you know? I sure hope nothing happens to you ladies. And... Do you think anyone would know if something happened to you here, all alone on the road? All while smiling. I'm in shock and can't believe this is happening to us. These are the men that we're supposed to trust and rely on, but here we were, trying to free ourselves from them for our own safety. Wanting to finish this now, I ask if we're getting a ticket, to which the cop by the driver's window says no, but I'll give you a verbal warning. All as I feel the other cop staring right at me. He wrote something in his notepad and said, Y'all be careful now. Wouldn't want anything bad to happen to you pretty ladies. Ain't that right? Then the officer next to me tries to open the door. The hell? Out of nowhere, he tried to open the door. But thankfully, the doors were locked and my window wasn't low enough for him to reach in and manually unlock the door. After this... I was in total shock, just staring at him while he just stared back. No explanation or anything. Angela quickly starts up the car, says thank you, have a good night, and speeds off. We didn't call our parents right then and there because it was the dead of night and we didn't want to worry them. But instead, Angela's boyfriend, who was already waiting for us at the university and asked to be called and updated in case of anything, after driving in silence while constantly checking if they were behind us for about 30 minutes, I start talking to Angela. I ask her, why stop us in the first place if we didn't commit any infraction? Then, we realized. They saw that we were two girls because of the stupid flashlight I used while recording and pulled us over. They also probably stayed in the car before walking towards us to check if it was actually only us two or something of the sort. They gave an uncomfortable aura, and I wouldn't be surprised if they were planning on raping us, or worse. Honestly, I can only imagine what would have happened if the doors were unlocked. So, the lessons to learn here are 1. Don't do road trips in the dead of night, especially if you're girls. 2. Don't unknowingly trust cops. There are good ones as there are evil. And three, always have someone know where you're at. Number four. This story was long forgotten by me up until today. One of my dogs, Lady, was recently put down due to cancer. So I spend most of my days thinking about my two dogs. Today I was thinking about my younger dog who is still with us, Ginger and all of the memories we have together so far. After a few good memories, I remembered the event that I'm about to share. This story takes place over nine years ago. I was in the fifth grade and I had just gotten Ginger. She was three, maybe four months old at the time, and I absolutely loved her. My family had decided to get a second dog, but only after I had begged them for two years for a friend for Lady. Lady was around two years of age and was the most well-behaved dog I had ever met and still holds that title after her passing. The only time she acted up was when someone came onto our property. For such a little dog, she was incredibly brave. One night, I'm sitting with my mother and two younger sisters, age seven and four, when someone rang our doorbell. I remember it being pretty late in the afternoon, maybe six or seven, 
Lady flew off the couch and ran towards the door, barking at it. Ginger tried to follow along with her sister, but couldn't quite keep up with her. We all went to the door to see who it could be and I picked up Ginger so that she wouldn't run out until my seven-year-old sister picked Lady up to calm her down. Without even thinking or asking my mum first, I opened the door right up. A major lapse in judgement for me, which honestly surprises me when I think about it. We didn't live in a bad neighbourhood at all, but we were still taught stranger danger. A man stood on our doorstep. A white truck with a decal on the side was parked on the street. He was maybe in his late 20s, early 30s. He wasn't incredibly tall and had scraggly facial hair. He gave my mum, sisters and me a smile and jumped into his sales pitch. It went something along the lines of, Hello ma'am and kiddos, I'm a mobile meat salesman. I sell beef, chicken, lamb and pork. I bet you guys spend a lot of time at the supermarket shopping for the right kind of meat to make dinner with. My sisters and I stood by quietly, the younger ones behind my mum with me standing right next to her with Ginger in my arms. Lady kept a low growl going and showed her teeth to the man. My mum looked at the man and simply responded with, Sorry, my husband brings home the bacon and went to close the door. The guy didn't seem to be having any of this. He pushed the door just enough to grab Ginger from my arms. He stepped off the step and said, What a nice puppy. I think I'm going to keep her. I panicked so hard in this moment and started hyperventilating. My mum leapt outside, ripped Ginger out of his arms and slammed the door and locked it. I was hysterical and my sisters were crying. She basically told the guy to fuck off and ushered us to the bedroom and put the dogs in the room with us, shutting the door. I remember the guy yelling rude things directed towards my mum as he got into his truck and sped off. She spent a lot of time in the front window, keeping a watchful eye on the house. She called my dad and told him what had happened, causing him to rush home much earlier. After the call to my dad, she called one of her friends who lived a street over and told her what had happened warning her not to open her door. I got reprimanded for my actions, and let me tell you, I never did that again. I won't even open the door today unless I know for sure who's at the door. Number 3 This happened last semester when I was finishing 10th grade. I am a teenage girl with almost no enemies, which makes this story even weirder. I am still a little nervous to tell this story because of the person it involves, but I will just hope for the sake of my life that it doesn't get back to them. So, this all began in my science class on the very first day when my teacher created the seating plan. Unfortunately, this was one of those teachers that didn't want you sitting with your friends. He believed that this was a good way to get us to meet new people. But trust me when I say that there are some people you just don't want to meet. My teacher sat me with a boy who I had never seen before, named Al. Right away, I got a kind of weird vibe from him, so I tried to focus on my worksheet to avoid conversation. Yes, I know this sounds a little bit rude, but it was a quiet class anyways, so not introducing yourself wasn't really out of the ordinary. He was the type of person who didn't really have any social skills, and he seemed very awkward. He didn't seem to take very good care of himself either, and even though I was at least a foot or two away from him, I could smell his disgustingly bad breath. Apparently, we weren't the only people who didn't want to introduce ourselves, because an awkward silence filled the entire room. My teacher noticed this and stood up in front of the class. I know it may feel weird sitting beside a stranger, but it'll be a lot better if you just get to know each other. I want you to turn to the person I've seated you with, shake their hand and tell them your name. Great, now I have to talk to this guy. We introduced ourselves and then we shook hands. His hands were extremely sweaty and the way he lingered during the handshake really creeped me out. Most people's conversations ended there and then they went back to work. And that's what I was hoping for too, but of course, that's not what happened. For about a minute, things were quiet, but the entire time, he was staring at me. 
I looked over at him after a while because it was a bit strange how he was staring and I wanted him to stop. Before I could ask what he was doing, he started talking to me. What kind of music do you like? He asked awkwardly. I told him what I listened to and then I returned the question because I didn't want to seem rude. Then he said in the most monotone and serious voice ever, I fucking love Nicki Minaj. I love everything about her. She is the most beautiful woman ever. At first I chuckled a bit because I thought maybe he was joking, but then I realized he was completely serious. I was surprised because he didn't really seem like he would like her music, but apparently he had even been to a concert. He later told me that he didn't even really like her music that much. He just liked her body. I didn't really care that much, and this wasn't the creepy part, but it does add to the story, especially later, so I'm including it. He started telling me about his other classes, that he focused so much on his Spanish class. I asked him why he liked Spanish so much. He stared me directly in the eye. Miss Johnson is the hottest teacher I've ever seen. I love her so fucking much. I didn't really know how to answer that. So I just said, oh, cool, I heard she's nice. He said in the creepiest way possible, yeah, and she's thick. I like him thick. I thought this was really weird, but this guy didn't seem like someone whose bad side you'd want to get on. So all I said was, yeah, there are pretty good teachers at this school. I didn't think there was anything wrong with what I said and I definitely didn't expect the reaction that I got. Suddenly, he had some weird outburst. Fuck no, I fucking hate Mr. Johns. He's a piece of shit, he said angrily. I had no idea that what I said would provoke him like that. The teacher who he was talking about was one of the most well-liked teachers in our school. I didn't know anyone who didn't like him. Apparently, he taught Alpha English last semester, and clearly... Things didn't go very well. I didn't ask why he hated him so much and I figured it might just be best to play along in this situation before this kid caused a scene. Yeah, he's my drama teacher and he doesn't seem that great. Even though I was totally lying because I knew what a good teacher he was. This kid talked to me almost the entire class. I was barely even talking back to him and I was giving him one-word answers for most of the questions that he was asking me, yet he wouldn't stop talking to me. It was honestly really annoying, but he was intimidating, so I didn't do anything about it. I just wanted him to shut up so that I could do my work. As the days went by, I realized just how weird this guy was. He told me all about his problems as if I was his therapist, but he didn't say a single word to anyone else in the class. I think he knew that I was the only one who wouldn't call him out for being such a creep because I was scared of him, and I had to sit beside him for the rest of the year. I dreaded science every single day because I hated listening to him. I never got any work done. He would tell me the most personal and disgusting things about himself. He told me about how he had a foot fungus on his toe, and he even pulled out his phone to show me pictures. I was really grossed out, but I didn't want to make him mad, so I just went along with it. After a few days, he brought up Mr. Jones again, that teacher who he hates. I have never heard someone more angry in my life. You know I planned on killing him, right? I want him dead, and I wasn't afraid to do it. The only thing stopping me was the law, but maybe one day I'll find a way around it. He said this with a terrifying blank stare in the most serious way a person could speak. I was really concerned, but all I said was, Well, you don't want to risk going to jail. I really wanted to tell a teacher or a counsellor because something seemed extremely off inside of his head, and I don't doubt that he would actually do it. The thing is, if he got in trouble for making threats like that, then he would know that it was me who told on him. If I got him in any trouble, I knew that he'd be coming for me, and it would be easier for him to kill me than any of the teachers. I told my friends about it, 
and it turns out that one of my friends knew him. She said that he was a complete nutcase and that if he made a threat like that again that I should probably tell a teacher. She agreed that he wasn't even slightly joking when he said that. For the rest of the semester, he would ask me creepy questions and randomly swear under his breath. One time, he asked me what my stripper name would be if I was a stripper. I have never talked to him about anything like that, so it was really creepy and random that he would even ask that. I was genuinely afraid of him, and I really wanted him to like me because I was so afraid of being on his bad side. He was very violent and talked about revenge a lot, and he had such a short fuse. One day, we had to be lab partners, and for the activity that we were doing, we needed a source of gas. I turned on the gas so that we could use it, and he started swearing and yelling at me. He called me stupid and said I was wasting gas. I knew I wasn't wasting gas and that he was just being ridiculous. But I just told him that I was sorry and asked if he wanted to be in charge of the gas instead. Because I didn't want the teacher to think I was causing problems. There was another incident where we were learning about the carbon cycle and how cows contribute to it. My teacher was trying to be funny and he said something like, Whenever I drive past a farm, I always make sure to plug my nose so I don't smell the cow poop. Then, out of nowhere, Al loudly blurts out to the entire class. I inhale deeply and say, Mmm. The whole class, except for me and him, burst out laughing. I didn't laugh because I knew he was probably serious. And he didn't laugh because he definitely was serious. For the next hour of our class, he told me about his poop fetish. Yeah, you heard that correctly. His fucking poop fetish. You have no idea how hard it was to keep a straight face while he was telling me this. He said there was nothing that he loved more than the smell of poop. And he even ate some horse poop one time. This was really hard to listen to. It began to get unbearable when he started telling me how he didn't even use the toilet paper sometimes. Because he liked playing with his own poop. And how he purposely touched other people's stuff afterwards. Because it turned him on knowing that other people came into contact with his poop. After about an hour of listening to him talk about his poop, I was getting really annoyed and grossed out. I started being a little rude and I sarcastically said, Cool. At the end of his disgusting story, I soon realized that this was a big mistake. He became really angry at me and started yelling at me. My classmates were staring at me now and wondering what I did to get yelled at. It was super embarrassing, so I tried to calm him down before he made an even bigger scene. I lied and said I wasn't being sarcastic and that I actually did think it was cool. It took me about three minutes of me apologizing and convincing him before he finally calmed down. Sadly, I had to keep listening to his creepy and annoying remarks, but trust me when I say that it got even creepier. One day, he walked into class late and extremely pissed off. After the teacher's lesson was over, he started ranting to me like a maniac. I hate everybody in this stupid fucking school. I wish I could just come in here with a gun and just shoot everyone and then myself afterwards. I don't even care anymore. He said with his piercing eyes staring directly at me. I was so scared because... Nobody in their right mind says that to someone who they barely know. I wanted to tell someone so badly, but there was no way I could prove what he said. I didn't want him to find out that I got him in trouble too, so I didn't really tell anyone except a few close friends. I tried to convince him otherwise, and that hurting anyone in our school would be a horrible idea, but that just resulted in him getting mad at me. I worry that if one more teacher makes him mad, he really will act on his thread and bring a gun to school. He definitely fits the profile of a school shooter. Socially awkward, loner, lack of compassion, poor judgment, and not caring about the consequences of his actions. Every day, I worried that he might pull out a gun from his creepy oversized bag that he carries around. Luckily, it's now summertime and I'm out of school for a while, 
so I don't have to see that psycho until September, although he did harass and scare people in other ways. There are too many incidences to remember, but I'll name a few. That Spanish teacher who I mentioned he was showing interest in earlier was obviously annoyed by his behavior in her class. I wasn't there to see what happened, but he told me that he was planning to take another course that she teaches, just so he could be in her class. My guess is that he made inappropriate comments to her during Spanish, and she found out that he was planning on taking her other class, because my friend saw him and the Spanish teacher in the counselor's office. I was told by Al that he was no longer able to take that class. I can only assume that the Spanish teacher didn't allow him to take it because of his creepy behavior, and that's what they were discussing in the counselor's office. Another time, he called over the class be a tutor who was a male and one year older than us. He asked for help on a question, but still wasn't able to understand even after the peer tutor explained it, so he got very angry at him and told him that if he brought his white ass anywhere near him again, he'd get the shit kicked out of him. A few days later, he called the peer tutor over again, and I thought maybe he would apologize, but no. He looked the peer tutor dead in the face and said in his usual creepy monotone voice, Wanna get milked? The peer tutor was really creeped out, and luckily, he just left. After he left, Al stared at me and said, I like fucking with him, you know. One day I'm a milk his ass like a cow. He is seriously the creepiest person I've ever met. Edit. I started to think about how dangerous it could be if nobody reports what he says to the teachers. So I'm going to try and figure out a way to get them informed without putting me in danger when school starts. Edit. I have a member of law enforcement in my family, so I will be talking to him about this situation to see if there is anything that police could do. If the police can't do anything, I need to talk to my counsellor on the first day of school anyways. So, I'll bring it up to him while I'm there. Number 2 A few years ago, my partner and I moved from the East Coast to the Pacific Northwest. We didn't know anyone in this city, we just saved up a decent chunk of money and hopped onto a plane. It was exciting and we certainly haven't regretted it. The plan was to stay at hostels and cheap hotels until we could find work in an apartment. Finding work was actually quite easy for us. We had new jobs within a week of getting off of the plane. Finding somewhere to live though was a nightmare. Everywhere we looked had incredibly steep requirements for credit scores and minimum household income. We tried more legitimate sites at first, but after two months of hopping around to different hostels, motels, and Airbnb places, we became desperate, so we went to Craigslist. Many of the listings we tried gave us just as much trouble at first. So one day, I'm desperately scouring Craigslist for rooms, and I come across one that seemed a little weird. The poster said that he had a very large house in a nice neighborhood, and that he wanted to rent out a 500 square foot room for $600 per month, utilities included. In this city, that was suspiciously cheap. He also wrote it in a rambling sort of way. It was almost half ad for a room and half open letter to everyone that had recently accused him of being creepy. Now obviously, if we weren't so desperate, we wouldn't have even considered contacting this man. But we thought that we might have been at risk of running out of money before we could get in somewhere at this rate so we gave him a call. On the phone, he sounded relatively normal. He actually suggested that we meet up with him in a public place to talk about the room first. We agreed to meet him at a restaurant near the hostel we were staying at, though we didn't tell him which one of course. He showed up late and looked surprised to actually see us there. He sat down and he talked for a long time. I say he talked rather than we talked because he rambled non-stop about himself and how he felt persecuted by everyone in this city. He claimed to be an artist and a collector. In between him repeating himself many times about how the locals just don't understand his passions, he also told us that the room he had advertised was currently filled with his collection. He never once said what he collected, 
and that if things went well, he would have to hire people to move it into storage before we could move in. At one point, he stopped abruptly and ran to the restroom. We took this opportunity to discuss the situation. We knew at this point that he was probably a crazy person, but the threat of homelessness was looming. So we agreed that we should at least see the place and decide based on that, rather than his eccentricities. He came back to the table sweaty and flustered. We weren't sure why at the time, but we figured it out later. Before we could say anything, he blurted out, I want to show you the apartment right now. We were surprised by this, but we had just discussed seeing it, so we agreed. I asked him to text me the address and that we would take public transportation and meet him there. He insisted that he drive us there since we didn't have a car. Now we were obviously hesitant to get into his truck. It was obvious even to him, I think. But the previous mentioned desperation was still a thing and we were pretty sure he wasn't going to try and hurt us. So we crammed into the front seat of this tiny, rusty ancient looking pickup truck. My partner was pressed up against the door and I was uncomfortably close to the driver as he continued his babble about how the city had gone downhill and how everyone he used to hang out with shuns him to this day. At one point, I whispered to my partner to get ready for a possible tuck and roll situation. He saw me whispering but couldn't hear me over the wind roaring through the cab of the truck. One of the windows was broken out. It really added to the vehicle's charm. And he said something about how we were romantic together and that he envied our youth. We arrived at his house minutes after that. He had technically been honest up to this point. His neighborhood was decent looking, and his home was a pretty large one-story ranch house. I noted out loud that he had bars on all of his windows and several locks on his front door. He said that his collection was very valuable to him, and he was just protecting it from thieves. Once he let us in, I made a point of urging him ahead so he couldn't get a chance to lock the door behind us. We very quickly noticed three things. His art, his collection, and the smell. The man's method of art, of which he was very proud, was apparently to take lots of innocent childlike things. Baby dolls, stuffed animals, ceramic figurines, children's toys, etc. And attach dildos to them. One of the most notable pieces being the one he referred to as his unicorn. It was a ceramic horse figurine that he sloppily sawed the head off of and replaced it with a baby doll's head and added a hand sculpted clay penis as the horn. His collection consisted mainly of rubber, plastic and latex clothing and gas masks. Both his collection and his art was everywhere. The place was so jam packed with junk that every room had a single file path going through it that you could walk without bumping into art or stepping on piles of fetish wear. This fellow was definitely not concerned about cleanliness. This place reeked of mildew and moldy rubber. The carpet looked as if it hadn't seen a vacuum since the 70s. As we passed through the kitchen, he declared that he loves cast iron pans because you don't have to wash them. Just as we noticed that every countertop was cluttered with rusted pans that all looked to have decades worth of scorched food caked on. We stayed behind him, mostly silent as he stopped every now and then to point out his favorite art pieces and to repeatedly tell us that he was leading us to the room that was full of his favorite stuff right now, but that he'd get people to move it out for us. He said that like us moving in was a sure thing. He opened the door to the room and actually said, Voila! I don't doubt that the room was around 500 square feet, but every inch of it was stuffed with clothing racks. The clothing racks were all packed with the same thing. Shiny, rubber latex, and plastic pairs of pants with dildos sewn to the front of them. Up to this point, we were doing our best to avoid reacting to all of the freaky stuff in this guy's home, because we were afraid he would snap on us if we did. But... I started to notice after a while though that he was getting disappointed that we weren't reacting to anything. My guess is that he gets off on shocking people with his creepy pants and that this wasn't going as well as he had hoped. We told him that the room looked big enough and that we'd like to go back to our hotel and think it over. He didn't have much of a reaction to that but he agreed to drive us home now. When he thought that I wasn't looking 
He took something out of his pocket and tossed it through the open doorway of a dark room on his way past it. I was afraid that it might have been his car keys, so I used the light on my phone to peek in as we passed that room. The whole room was a pile of tied off used condoms. We later speculated that he was masturbating at the restaurant and added a balloon to the pile before taking us back. So we piled back into his truck and had a long, awkward drive back to the place we had met. His rambling was much more frustrated this time around and he passed where we wanted to get out three times before we just jumped out at a red light, frantically shouting, This is good here. Well, it was nice to meet you. Thanks. Bye. I added his number to my contacts as Mr. Creepypants. Over the next several days, he sent a few texts asking if we talked it over yet. I wanted to be polite, so I just said, We've decided against it, but thank you for the very nice offer. He responded with the phrase, Are you creeped yet? Copied and pasted over and over about 30 times. I'm not sure why I was still trying to be polite, but when he stopped spamming me, I responded, No, we thought that your collection was lovely, but just so large that we can't bring ourselves to ask you to move it. It took him a few more days to respond, but he did, and he took it better than I expected. Yeah, I really didn't want to move it anyway. Thanks for understanding. He then made a recommendation for a local burger place for some reason. I blocked his number shortly after that, just to be safe. Number 1 My boyfriend and I had gotten a two-bedroom, two-bathroom unit on the top or second floor of a lower-end apartment complex about eight years ago. The economy had gone shit, so with job troubles, we had to get what we could afford. Our apartment was up a flight of stairs that went up parallel to the building, came to a small landing, then turned 90 degrees to the right and went up some more stairs to the second floor. The area at the top of the stairs, if you were facing the building, had our door on the right side, some space for a couple of stairs, the stairs in the middle, some space for a couple of chairs, and the door for the one bedroom unit next to us on the left. The one bedroom was on the corner of the building we were in. Our building faced another building that was identical to ours. There were two buildings to the far side of our building, one next to us and one across from that. A large grassy space between the one bedroom next to me and another set of four apartment buildings in the same configuration. A path ran down the middle of all of the buildings. Each set of stairs ended at the sides of the path, as did the path to each first floor apartment. Over the two years we lived there, we saw all sorts of things. A group of Hispanic couples lived in the one bedroom next to us for a while. There were at least six people living there, sometimes more. I always hated imagining how cramped it must have been in that unit, especially after I got to see inside it a while after we'd been living there. That group was mostly quiet and didn't cause any trouble. They made an effort to keep to themselves. We saw three different tenants in that unit over those two years. The last was a single guy named Carmine that I became friends with, which was how I got to see the inside of that apartment. While living in this complex, I overheard what sounded like a life or death fight in the apartment under the one bedroom next to me. It was so loud, so violent, so terrifying, and there was so much screaming that I reluctantly called the police. When they arrived, they found blood on the floor to the apartment and a trail of blood leading away on the path between the buildings. The police had broken down the door and found that a gay couple living there had gotten into a fight and one guy had stabbed the other in the stomach. The blood trail was from the guy who had stabbed his boyfriend. Apparently, he had cut his hand pretty badly and when he had left, he caused the bloody mess outside. My boyfriend and I ended up having to go to court over this incident because the police came up to my unit and begged me to give an official statement since they said that they didn't have a cause to have broken the door down without it. There were a few scary and violent things that happened. For example, more domestic abuse, a huge fight at the pool with at least 20 people, and a couple of break-ins. One day in the middle of the summer, I was out in a little area by the front door having a cigarette. I don't smoke inside because A. It's gross. B. It stinks up all your stuff, and C. 
I don't want to expose my pets to it. We kept a big Rubbermaid container outside to store recyclables until we could take them to the recycling plant, along with a blue fold-up camping chair and a small table with an ashtray. I had been standing next to the chair and looking over the balcony at the cat in the window of the unit directly across from me, when I saw a guy come walking through on the path between all the buildings. I sat down to hide myself and so I could reach the ashtray to put out my cigarette when I heard... Hey, hey miss. I didn't respond, put out my cigarette and stood up to go inside. Hey girl, what's up? Excuse me. He says and I notice he sounded much closer. In my head, I thought if I acknowledged him, maybe he'll go away. Yes? I said as I turned to see that he had come up to the landing in the stairs and was staring at me. He must have made an effort to be quiet because he had to weigh at least 230 pounds and was a bit over 6 feet tall and I hadn't heard the stairs creak as he came up the first set like they usually did and he had covered the distance between where he had been and where he was now very quickly. While I have taken Taekwondo and self-defense classes, I also have really bad knees and have had quite a few surgeries on them. I'm also barely 5 feet tall and weighing 110 pounds. In other words, it's best if I can avoid physical confrontation, especially against someone that large. Can I bomb a Lucy? He asks with this threatening look on his face. His mouth was smiling, but it was forced and it didn't reach his eyes. And his eyes made me very apprehensive. There was no warmth in them. He didn't look away but his eyes would flick down to what he could see of me above the short wall of our little patio area and then back up. He didn't try to be nice or funny or offer to pay or hit on me or tell me why he was asking like people often do when they try to bum a smoke. Most people look a bit embarrassed and hopeful when they ask. He was just glaring at me, calculating something, but at the same time had this fake wooden smile on his face. My heart was beating wildly as my brain quickly assessed the situation. I didn't like that this big guy had stealthily climbed the stairs part way, apparently in the short second or two my back was turned, just to ask for a cigarette. Why not ask before you climbed halfway, in case the answer was no to save yourself that effort? Why was he glaring with cold eyes but faking a smile? In my head, I remember thinking, Shit. My neighbor Carmine is at work, and so is my boyfriend Jason, so I'm on my own here. I did my best to keep my fear and apprehension off of my face. Out loud I said, Sorry, I don't have any more, I just smoked my last one. Which was true, as I began backing towards my door. The guy sneered. Are you sure? I answered in a clear, strong voice. Yes, I'm sure, I don't have any more, sorry. As I finished speaking, I felt the doorknob with my hand, and none too soon because his fake smile slipped away as he began to lunge up the rest of the stairs. That container of recyclables was right next to the door. Thankfully, I knew to navigate around it by heart after months of lugging groceries up the stairs. I yanked the door open while twisting around, flew inside and turned to shove the door shut. As I began to push the door, my other hand already on the deadbolt to slam it home as soon as the door was closed, the guy reached the area in front of my door. He wasn't expecting the big container so he ran into it and stumbled forward, but managed to get his left hand out to grab the door before it was closed. I had already been in full force push against the door, so his hand wasn't enough to stop it. It slammed with his fingers in the jam and he hollered, yanking his hand back instinctually. I shoved the door shut as he went for the knob to open it with his other hand. With quite literally no time to spare, I twisted the latch to slide the deadbolt home. The guy then began yanking on the knob and rattling the door in its frame, twisting the doorknob back and forth trying to get it open. I ran to the kitchen and grabbed one of my dining room chairs and shoved it under the doorknob to keep the door from opening. Unfortunately for me, there was a very large window directly next to the door, right over where the Rubbermaid box sat outside which had slipped partially away from the window when he fell. Between the pounding on the door and the screaming, Let me in, you fucking bitch. You broke my fingers, you stupid fucking whore. I'm going to kill you when I get my hands on you. Open this fucking door. Among other horrible things, he 
he would walk over to look in the window, cupping his hands around his face to see better. I have no idea why he didn't break the window, but thankfully, he didn't. I ran over and yanked my blackout curtains closed, which caused him to yell and pound on the door even louder. I had had my cell phone with me outside in the little patio area by the door while I was smoking. Thankfully, I had put it in my pocket out of habit before I crushed my cigarette. It took me a frantic minute of searching to figure out where it was. All the while, this guy continued to pound and kick on my door and scream obscenities. I knew that nobody else was likely to call the police, simply because in bad neighborhoods, most people don't want to get involved but also because it was the middle of a weekday and most people weren't home. The husband of the elderly couple that lived below me was almost deaf, and his wife worked part-time during the day so she wasn't home. I frantically called 911, and it didn't take much explaining to get the police hurrying on their way, because the operator could clearly hear this guy over the phone. While waiting for the police to arrive, I locked myself and my cats in the bathroom and barricaded the door. I brought my thick wooden bat with me and stayed on the phone. At some point, the guy must have either given up or heard the sirens and took off before the police arrived. I gave them a more detailed description and they searched for him in the area, but they never found him as far as I know. I called Jason who was stuck at work on a double shift and couldn't leave and then my mum. I ended up crating the cats and taking them over with me to spend the night at my mum's so they wouldn't be alone. It took me hours to stop shaking and I was paranoid the rest of the time we lived there. I never saw the guy again. <laughs>